money. Never far from our thoughts. So why is it when someone talks about finances, we get heavy eyelids, fall asleep, and dream of what we'd do if we were rich? In this podcast series, Kent Tilly does his best to make us yawn with laughter as he delves into gut-busting topics like debt consolidation, asset management, taxation, and budgeting. Still awake? Good. No matter your income level, you will certainly learn something from this series. However, the focus is on underserved low- and middle-income Canadians who struggle with monthly cash flow and can't get quality advice because they can't afford to access it. In each episode, Kent interviews experts who specialize in helping people get back on their financial feet and get on track. He'll break it down step-by-step and demystify the process of taking control of your money. If Kent can figure it out, it can't be that hard. Trust me, I've seen him try and fold a fitted sheet. So thank you for listening, and welcome to the Kids in the Will podcast, Episode 1, Kent Tilly. I just started comedy, and then I got hired by, like, the actual branch to do their Christmas party. And I didn't know anything about the business. And that was my first paid comedy gig, which is really weird. And then about two years later, I uh, I was still doing comedy. I really enjoyed it at the time. I was doing, like, not bad for a comedian in Canada, which doesn't mean much. But uh, And I was looking for a new career and went and thought, you know, these people looked fancy at this Christmas party. And I kind of thought maybe I'd get into sales and control my destiny a little bit and and always knew I needed to know more about money. So that worked. And we had a handshake deal that I could do comedy and continue to do it. Uh, we, there was some other things involved in that. Uh, like I couldn't I couldn't swear and be really dirty and couldn't talk about the business and I couldn't talk about the company. Totally fine. I just wanted to still do it as a glorified hobby, which is what it is for me, where, you know, a glorified hobby that I get paid a little bit of money for. And five years in, I went to management training in a town that will remain nameless and, and did a, uh, the guest spot. Uh, which because a friend of mine that's a comedian one of Canada's best comedians was in town and I told everybody we needed to see him and head office found out and they gave me an ultimatum and they said you either have to quit comedy or you're fired basically and that was five years in and I had a book and you know I was doing pretty well I was winning their awards and I but um you know, I couldn't do that to myself. So this led to this transition. You sort of said, well, okay, if you're going to make me make this choice, I'm going to choose to have comedy still available. And then you made, I guess, the bold leap into self-employment and really went into a model that was not all that common at the time. So, and I think we're seeing more of it today, but can you talk a little bit about the business model that you now find yourself operating in or maybe what it was then and what it is now? Totally. It's adapted and there's a lot more competition for me in the space. But I, when I was at, a, at the old firm, almost said what it was, I was always like, I need to do videos. I hate cold calling. I hate the traditional methods of prospecting, uh, you know, going out to events. And like, I, I hated being at a party and having to be like, so like, what, what kind of mutual funds do you have or who do you work with or what I hated it and and I'm really bad at it right like so I was always like uh what all it really is is like let's teach people you know uh let's help them understand what it is that they need to know and what it is that they don't know and that should drive clients just because they're asking questions and so it was like what's the best form to do this in especially for me with a performance background I was like I'm going to use comedy to drive traffic on YouTube where I'm teaching people about money and uh, 
at that time also well simple was sort of coming into the fold it's a very easy for me to not sell funds anymore but tell people they can invest over here but i can add on a referral fee for my planning services uh, and well simple will invest the money and that's it and i can charge less because i have way less overhead it's easy for me to convert i have way less paperwork all of these things that until COVID happened i was one of the very few that could do everything sort of digitally um, well you were using at the time i guess well simple for advisors and yeah that's if i'm not that's not it's not available anymore you would just switched off that at some point kent yeah, not of our own choosing, but yeah, we yeah. we got yeah. pushed off of that. It was a absolutely horrendous transition that uh, put me back probably about two years from where I was. Uh, it was a it was a nightmare scenario. Yeah, I can see uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've heard that from a few others too. I know some others that had made that full transition, and again. You know, we recently had an interview, one that will have aired before this, from somebody not using obviously well simple, but using another digital asset manager and sort of talking the merits of that business. But you know, I always wonder about this. It, you know, how comfortable is it hitching your wagon to you know a, a service provider like that? And is there anything you can do to mitigate risk on that? <laughs> I didn't have a choice at the time, right? I had to yeah. hitch my wagon to one yeah. and i thought yeah okay, you're well, like at the time that was it that was the way to do it so, yeah and yeah. i'm like i'm some low level loser right that is like nobody knows who i am and well simple was advertising all over the place people really knew about them it was an easier sell than to be like look i'm going to be your planner and you're also going to invest your money with this company nobody's ever heard of um and they were fantastic for years um all of my clients really liked them uh the customer service was pretty good during times of like kind of exponential growth there you could feel that the service sort of fell a little bit during big transitions um now uh i predominantly use modern advisor i have a few other relationships with some other firms it was uh and the thing about him and Naveed, the guy that started it, is we have a really good relationship, and I understand, you know, what he's trying to do, and he understands what I'm trying to do, and we we talk quite a bit. Whereas, well, simple, I never spoke to the top. That's uh, that's a good distinction, and I think that does sort of tie into this idea of. You know, how do you mitigate that risk? Well, build relationships and maybe have more than one uh, relationship out there. So yeah, that's that's good, Ken. Thanks. Well, another thing that I thought was like the uh, you can uh, or you can get too big to fail, right? Because if somebody tries to come in and buy Modern's book, and I fifty percent of it is mine, they have to talk to me. Right. Right. Well, then, yeah. so there's that too, right? Where, and worst case, if it happens to me again, um, I might predominantly just go back to the fee for just the fee for service model. That was my in, initial intention, but I was like, I, I was worried about, you know, having to continuously get clients every, every year, every month. How would that work? I would have made more money in the beginning, I'm sure. Um, or get an asset manager that we hire that does it like, and you're like, listen, you're the person that manages all of these clients portfolios under the K4 umbrella and add that to it. But I didn't have money for any of the, right? I just, I didn't have yeah. any, I had to walk away like clean and I didn't want a lot of my old clients to come with me. It, right off the bat because I had spent five years convincing them that they were going to work with me forever at this place. Yeah. And if I failed, 
that I was like, I can't fail you twice. It was so hard for me to walk away, not from the company, but from all of these people that put their trust into me. So um, I was like, you can choose to come later. Yeah, I can see that challenge. You know, you're right. It's it's very much a relationship business and a trust business. And, you know, I guess there must have been some internal grappling with how you uh, how you deal with those relationships afterwards. Yeah. It was very, it, it was a very difficult thing, right? You don't, I, that's the hard part about it is, is the only thing I find hard about this business is the emotion. Right. Um, yeah, you're, you're right. The, the technical, where I live my life mostly, right. is, uh, is the easy part. So, yeah. I, I know, I and I tried. I was like, well, if I'm teaching you all the time the technical, then you're making the decisions yourself, yourself, and it's not me trying to do any convincing. Yeah. So then I'm not the one. And even though I don't touch the money, I'm still seeing like, oh, I got good returns with Kent last year. And it's like, never say that. <laughs> you say that. Uh, because I don't want to be the one that you came back and said, oh, the, I got killed last year with Kent because it's just the market anyway. That's it. Um, so you talk about education and, you know, the first time that I sort of was aware that you had left, I think, was um, from seeing you on YouTube. Yeah. That was my first indicator. Um, you got out on YouTube pretty early with these uh, sort of snippet-sized financial education videos can you talk a little bit about how that worked for you? Was that like an effective client recruiting tool or was it more like it replaced the conversation at parties about, you know, what mutual fund are you in? What role did that fill for you and how's it worked for you since? Well, I kind of want to give you an answer that says it doesn't work. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the answer. Like that's, I don't think that it's a no brainer that this is a way to build a business. So oh, yeah. there's a, it's the greatest tool of all time. I don't okay. do anything other than videos. I don't yep. do any prospecting. And now like if somebody gets to talk to me, then they're like, Oh my God, it's Kent. Right. Kent, famous from YouTube. Famous so. from YouTube. Yeah. Um, and so they're coming because you triggered something. In the beginning, it drove a, about 50-50 of like people I knew yeah. and people I didn't know. Uh, and in the beginning, it was harder to get people I didn't know from around the country. And I've talked to you about this before. I started getting a really big following and like, Ottawa on YouTube. I don't know what it was with the algorithm or something. And it was probably about 50% of every, every person that emailed was, uh, was from that area, Ottawa, Toronto, somewhere in there. Um, and then when now it, it depends on the focus, but all of my my viewers, what is it? 77% of my viewers are over 55 years old interesting so ontarians and over 55 right so just yeah. just like you right this is exactly i mean yeah. apparently old people like my comedy and young people think it's absolute garbage which <laughs> is kind of kind of true from actually the truth be told it just it makes sense because you start getting near that retirement age and you're like looking and you're like now I'm taking it very seriously. Yeah. I've been saving my whole life, but I don't know anything. Like, can I do this? What are the things I need to think about? And whereas, obviously, if you're listening to my voice, I mean, how my comedy works is because it's slow and monotone. I don't have, I can't even talk fast enough to get a TikTok video out. <laughs> right? So it's like, you know, I, but YouTube allows me to elaborate and teach very slowly and say, like, uh, I, I'm i very interested in making sure people can understand topics that they think are complex, but aren't. 
this business is not rocket science, but everything about it is made to appear like, you know, there's, there's, it's too complex for the average individual to understand. Uh, corporate tax planning, on the other hand, who fly, yeah. like, get out of here, right? We won't go into that, right? Nobody's doing seven minute videos on uh, like the right kind of shareholder agreement or whatever. So yeah, I, right. I, I'm right. with you. But, but that's not your client, right? Like you're not looking for that no. kind of client. You're looking no. for like the average Canadians. Old, yeah. Uh, just trying to get ahead. I always said, I don't care how much money you had in the beginning. I always said, uh, are you trying? Are, are you going to put in some effort? And it was actually like force people to put in effort because I sent them big giant forms that they had to fill out by themselves. I would never chase them. Um, and if they got it back, then I would, and I always, I always told you before we started this, that I did it like the capstone and unfortunately they don't do capstone anymore. Right. Went away in 2019. So yeah. And I miss it. Kent. I thought that was a good course. I think it was very important because I, it, I based K4 on that. I said, imagine if you could get every Canadian to give you every piece of information they have. I'm like, you could improve their situation, even if it was in only a minor way, every time. Yeah. And I, I said, you know, do it like that. And I wrote my plans like you had written the the plan. And then I would have sections and I would move them around. And I and once the first, you know, templates were done it became fast. It was like, I can write a full blown, like handwritten computer written financial plan. That's 15 pages in a couple hours. But the first one took me forever. Right. I like think, the first you know, yeah, capstone. I mean, those took a hundred, 120 hours of work. So you took me been. 10. <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> I did, because I, my old job was exactly like it. And I was like, oh, yeah. this is all that it is, is like moving things around. It was like, you know, I, I literally, it, I was like, I could do this in a minute and everybody else was struggling. And I was like, this is not, I mean, because you'd been doing it. My, yeah, my old job as a quantity surveyor, we it was like reports identical to that. They all oh, had to cover the same things, but you would just like find what's missing and then change it. And so I was like, because people aren't that much different. You've got a couple with kids. You've got a couple without kids. You've got retirees. You've got, and then each one, you're still including the six areas, but some are more important than others. Okay. Yeah, I guess I and I didn't know about your background as a quantity surveyor. I'm not even sure what that actually means. Who so. is right? I didn't even know. <laughs> I was, uh... um, now, one of the things I notice here on YouTube, I, I like this a lot. I find that uh, like the comment field is always a minefield, right, with social media. Mm -hmm. um, but I find, and I haven't paid that much attention to it maybe recently, but at least a couple of years ago, you really used to, I think, not be. Uh, shy about the kinds of things that you would comment on. Are you still doing that? You still a uh, pretty free for all with your use of the comment field on YouTube? Depends, sure. I, all right. I'll I'll snap sometimes. Um, but I, I, what do you mean by that? I guess. <laughs> well, I mean when people like people are trolling, and you right. clear, like you know they're trolling, and you'll come back with a I think an appropriate response for a troll. I think sometimes I think. That's I'm fair. happy. To, I'm happy to. I can't stand them. You know, it's funny. I thought I was going to get trolled way more just because, but I think a lot of people will be like, he's like, I don't have anything to say because uh, like, it, this is, I'm not teaching opinions most of the time. You know, it's like, I'm just teaching you facts about financial planning. The one time was when I, talked about aurora maybe being like maybe you missed the party on aurora <laughs> and i oh. got trolled to hell yeah and i went back two years later i said how's that working out for you right yeah that's uh i mean 
Aurora, of all things, that those comments have not aged well, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, uh, and then, I mean, some people get mad at me and they're like, you know, like, speed it up, you piece of garbage. And I'm <laughs> like, well, you can speed it up. A lot of people watch the videos with like 1.25 or whatever. It's fine. Right, right. Yeah, that's good. Um, so... <laughs> what about then, you know, now you've got content that's uh, going to be six or seven years old, I think. That's going to be mm -hmm. about right. Yeah. What do you do about uh, keeping content updated or, you know, like, do you go delete old videos? And then, you know, as we see, like, CPP has gone through a lot of changes these last right. years, right? So. Well, I probably should, um, you know, and... Uh, but the thing is, is so my biggest vid two videos I've ever done we're both about CPP. Um, and in total, I think those two have uh, well over 400,000 views. And, um, and what I thought was, well, all it doesn't matter. And the one that first went was a year and a half old. And then all of a sudden, for no reason, it just started going. And it was the first time I ever went really viral. And I was like, what is happening? Um, I was just getting comments and comments and, and so that information, those numbers are going to be a little bit off now, but I always thought, well, I can just redo a CPP one identically every single year because you're getting a whole other whack load of people coming into having that conversation. So your never ending cycle of like things where you can just like, redo it almost the same thing it doesn't matter yep. um and so when you say uh for for example when you say did this work and all i have to tell people is like if my average video gets 1500 views what that means is that i had 1500 people in in a seminar with me for free cost me a little bit of money now to get somebody to edit it and whatever, but basically for free, uh, teaching them something. Yeah. Of course it works. Yeah. That's uh, like from that sort of perspective, if you, it's a numbers game, right? If you sort of look at it that way and you know, you can't beat that getting in front of 1500 people at a go. So, and especially those are qualified leads. Those are people who have, clicked on your video like they actively went to look for something right yeah they're they're looking for a reason they're trying to learn a lot of people just watch and do their own planning based off of watching me and other people in the space yeah. now and listening and reading and all of these things and that's great and there are so many people that are like can can you write a plan for me but i love my advisor that I'm paying 30 grand a year to. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, uh, doesn't, isn't that part of their job? Like, you know, so I'm like, no, I won't. Uh, I won't do it. I don't, I will, will not, you know, because I'm my first thing is going to be to tell you guys to leave and stop paying so much money especially I, if you're not getting planning advice. I think back in uh, season three, I want to say it was uh, mid season three. I had um, David field from papyrus on, and he actually specializes in doing like second opinion plans. So this is interesting that it's something that you kind of actively avoid. Well, I mean, I'll do it if I think I can steal the client, right? Like, or if I'm like, but I'm not going to just do it to do it chad now who works for me um he does like fee for service planning and a lot of them would be second opinion plans where they still have their money invest but one of my biggest things in there would be like you're paying 2.1 in fees on x amount of dollars and and what you should do is reduce that yeah um, I mean, I think there's something to be said too. A lot of times you don't have to switch advisors to do that. I think sometimes people have just never asked their advisor the kind of uncomfortable question. So, Right. Yeah, it depends who, who you're working with and where. And yeah. um, 
you know, yeah. I, I mean, the main goal of of my company was like education, um, and very and, and at the most basic level. Um, as you've said, I'm not out there focusing on small business owners and doctors and and people with because to me it's like, well, listen, I, most doctors are like, I I want to do something ridiculous, and my friend told me about this, and now I'm just arguing and saying, or you could be super rich with no risk. Right, like you, you could be perfectly fine and have way more money than you need without worrying about anything. Uh, but I'm not sexy enough, right? Like, <laughs> and so it shouldn't be sex. This is should be a boring thing, but people don't yeah. like boring. Yeah, I, so. I do agree with this. Like financial planning and investing, when it actually shows up in front of the client, should be pretty boring. That's hundred percent. Like yeah. you're going to want to fall asleep and I'm perfect for that. Like, <laughs> right. And I'm perfect for that. Like, <laughs> right.